and the title of my talk today is changing the engine without stopping the car and i don't know anything about cars uh, so this is with respect to documentation so many of you here may think that product documentation in open source has very different issues than that of the proprietary product documentation because typically there is an army of authors manning the documentation in the latter case and they may have easy access to fancy tools, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not the case. Because it doesn't matter how many people are behind the documentation uh, if you don't build it in a way that's suitable for your product and your users. So the most common issue that I see in open source documentation is there's the engine missing in the car. So there is no good documentation to start with. So think again, how many of you here are trying to get people interested in a car that's missing an engine? And the next common issue is not having a direction, which is forgetting about the users. Sometimes we get lost in the process of building the product so much that we forget about the people for whom we are building it, right? So documentation needs must exist in parallel with the product needs, uh, especially in open source where there are like too many choices it's easy to get lost. So good product documentation can be the key to bring, can be the key in bringing the users to your product uh, amidst other distractions. And what's the key to a good product documentation? It's bridging the gap between the mental model of the person who's writing about the product and that of the person who's seeking that particular piece of information. If all this seems daunting, we have help. So there are multiple documentation frameworks and approaches that can help. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples uh, going forward. So before we go to the next slide, so we can think for a moment. And if you want to restructure your product documentation from absolute chaos or even like get started with creating documentation, uh, these documentation approaches help write with a purpose. So define your purpose and uh, define your direction. Where do you want to go? And apply the improvements iteratively, diligently, and uh, make the journey easier a little bit every time. And also gr grow tolerance to inconsistencies. Um, it's okay uh, as long as you are heading in the right direction. Just don't worry about the destination and enjoy the journey. Yeah, a couple of examples here. Uh, data and data access. So um, many of you may have heard of these two popular documentation approaches. So data is an open standard to develop structured documentation. Uh, you cannot and probably should not bend data to your will uh, uh, because it, it's imposing, but for a purpose. Uh, if you don't want to make too many decisions, just follow instructions and get your documentation journey started, data might help you there. So it's like building your product documentation block by block. Uh, it focuses on functional quality and it's like picking a standard preset engine model for your users. Uh, when you follow diet access, uh, it may look very similar to data, but it's very different in its philosophy and an application. Uh, here, structure evolves more organically as you begin with cleaning up the first mess that you see. Uh, it makes your documentation journey more realistic and paced, focusing on deep quality. Uh, here you can build a customized engine for your users. And I want to end with a story. Um, so there is this car showroom where uh, the entrance sign says, good cars sold here. A critic walks into the store and asks the store manager, uh, good car sold here, uh, where else do you think uh, uh, you'll be selling the car? So the manager thinks, okay, yeah, that's redundant. Let me redo the sign and he makes the sign as good car sold. Uh, yet another person walks in and uh, they ask the manager that good car sold, uh, what? Otherwise you'll be giving it away for free. So the manager is now confused, not knowing what to do. He makes this sign to read as good cars. Nice and simple, right? Um, yeah, yet another person walks in and asks good cars. What, everyone else is selling bad cars or what? So the manager is like really frustrated now and not wanting to get into any trouble. He just makes it cars. Um, you'll think the story ends there, but no. Yeah, another person walks in 
and uh, asks what, I came in for a sandwich? No. So as much as you can empathize with the situation, that's your audience. So go build that engine today and do it in a suitable way for your audience. Thank you. Next up is Alistair. Hi there, um, I'm Alistair and I am a software engineer at Canonical. And today I'd like to talk to you about an interesting problem that we faced at Canonical and an interesting solution to it. So, at Canonical, we make a product called Juju for managing cloud applications. But for the purposes of this talk, Juju is 1.6 million lines of Go code that uses MongoDB to store its state. And because it uses Mongo, we've decided to replace Mongo with a SQL database. Mongo is slowing it down, and we want to speed it up. This means replacing all the Mongo transactions with SQL queries. So the question is, what is the best oh, what is the best way to communicate with a SQL Bay database from Go? That means how do we turn the Go data structures into SQL tables and columns, and how do we communicate back again? So we can do this by using the Go standard SQL library. We can write a SQL query such as this one, which selects a address with a house number, a street, a city, and an ID from the database. And we can send that query to the database. We can read the contents of the, the rows into the structs. Um, but as you can see, this big block of Go code is quite a lot to do that very simple task. Um, there's quite a bit of things in there that make it quite um, difficult um, and error prone. And we can do better than this. So what is the, the obvious solution? A ORM. So an ORM is a library that takes your SQL uh, database and manages it for you. You just ask the ORM what you want from your database. It generates all the SQL queries. It does all that for you, and it returns the results in the language you ask them for um, in, so Go, in, in like Go objects. Um, but there are problems with this. The fact that it generates the SQL queries itself means that they're not necessarily optimized and they're not necessarily exactly what we want. We want to write queries that are sympathetic to the database that we're using. So what we really want to do is write our own SQL queries and get all the benefits of an ORM. And we had an idea at Canonical how to do that. We looked around, no one else had done it, uh, so we implemented it. Um, the, the core of this idea is that instead of writing the columns of your SQL query out, you instead write the struct, the go struct that you want to put those columns into. So here we've got the address struct, um, and the dot star means that we want to fill all the fields of that address struct and fetch those from the database. And instead of writing a positional input placeholder, we write the field in a struct, in this case also the address struct, that we want to take that value from. And we've done it. It's called SQL Air, this project. Um, there are quite a few other features. I'll just show you some example code. So, well, this is um, how you tell SQL Air that the columns, which columns correspond to which fields of the database. So the number field corresponds to the house name column in the database. Um, and here is the code from earlier, but rewritten in SQL Air. So here we have the, the query at the top, and then we're getting the results from the database directly into a slicer, a list. So we're, we're taking, instead of manually scanning each column into each field of the struct, SQL Air takes care of all of that for you. It makes your life a lot easier. Admittedly, this code may not look particularly simple, but if you take some time to look at it, you'll realize uh, once you've had a proper look at the library, that it's, it is a lot better. Um, <laughs> so the library um, has other features as well, um, such as automatically preparing the queries on the database, support for transactions and things, but it's still a project that's very much in the alpha phase. 
Um, so if any of you guys are Go programmers or are inter interested in databases, please check this out. Um, we're on GitHub, and yeah, we would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Came in before the cuckoo. Next up is Amalith. Hello. Oh, did not mean to go that far. There we go. So I'm Amalith, and I work at MBOA on a project called JMP. I've been running Nixnet.services mostly solo for about six years. And I've co-host a couple podcasts, I'm a musician, and that's where you can find my contact info. The especially pertinent part of this slide is the Nixnet part. It's a collection of open source web services that I've been operating for all that time, six years, but I provide them publicly without charge. I do it for free. But in all that time, the most painful part of running Nixnet has been keeping up with the releases because all the different platforms where that software is developed and collaboration happens, they all have different capabilities for keeping up with releases. Some of them have inside notifications, some have RSS feeds, some have APIs, some have nothing. And for the custom front ends you might, you might see around, there's no way to know what they, what they support and what they don't. So on the surface, tracking releases in a unified way is not possible. But that's not quite accurate because they do all have one thing in common, and that's the version control system, Git. All of them, the, the release functionality on all of the different platforms are lightweight abstractions on top of Git tags. Sometimes those are annotated tags, sometimes they're lightweight tags. But to, to track releases across all of those platforms, all we have to do is understand Git tags. So Willow is a piece of software I've been developing that is an implementation of that idea. It's a, still in proof of concept stages, alpha quality, but it does work and I've been using it for a few months. This is the home page. We can track a new project. There's a list of them. It indicates what we're running at the moment, whether there's a new release, and it also embeds the release notes for that release in the page. So you can see whether you want to apply that update without ever leaving that one web UI. And this is an example of a Git only piece of software. It's not on GitHub, it's not on Forgeo, it's not on any of those. This is an annotated Git tag. Because Willow speaks Git, it understands that the annotation is the release notes and we put that in the web page. And for, for projects developed on platforms that have RSS feeds, we can ingest the HTML from the RSS feed, sanitize it, and then put it in the web page. And this is the, again, proof of concept form we have for adding new projects. We have the URL, the name, and we have to indicate the type of forge it is because there's not a great auto discovery system at the moment. There are some specifications around, but none of the, all of the forges do not implement that specification. And then this is an example of SQL Boiler. We are adding a new project. We indicate that we're one release behind the most recent release. And as soon as we click that button, we see it is the second one down. We have our currently running version, there's a new release, and we have the embedded release notes. Development is primarily happening on SourceHut. There is the short URL there, if you don't want to memorize the source at URL. Contributions happen over email, but I also want to set up a GitHub mirror where I can merge PRs locally, push to source at, and then syndicate to GitHub for people who prefer the pull request workflow. There are a couple of instant messaging platforms. There's also a mailing list through source at. So if this idea excites you about being able to track all your software releases from one centralized location, please come help me make that happen. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Gregory. Gregory. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Grigory, and I work on the distributed storage 
and data processing system, which is called Resisorus. And uh, today's talk, we decided to make on problems that are usually arise in distributed systems. And we thought for a long time about the format, and firstly we thought that it will be a song. So I started writing a song about the problems in distributed systems. I wrote a couple of verses. I sent it to my colleague who told me that they are good. So I wrote the third verse. And after that, I understood the small issue. Uh, the issue was that we both are terrible at, at singing. <laughs> so no songs for today. And I'll just tell one story from my job. Ah, not that one. Uh, so it was nice Friday evening. I was ready to leave the work and go to get a beer from my, with my friends. And well, uh, you know, this Friday evenings, I got an alert that one component in our cluster crashed. It was 9 p.m. and I decided just to have a look at what happened and the stack trace really scared me. The stack trace told me that our sorting algorithm is wrong. It was some operation that was distributively sorting some big table, and after the search result, it was not sorted. Okay, so I started the investigation. Uh, and firstly, let me tell a little bit about how our, our sort algorithm works. For that case, it consisted of two stages. During the first stage, the data was split into some parts and each part was independently sorted. And during the second phase, these sorted streams were merged into one sorted table. And the system crashed because the result of the second stage was incorrect. The rows were not in the proper order. So the bug was either in the first stage when we were sorting rows or in the second stage when we were merging the sorted streams. It was really surpri surprising because this code was quite simple. The sorting of the rows is just a call of the sort from the standard library, and the merge is just a simple algorithm with heap. So it seems quite weird. After that, I spent an hour or two or trying to figure out where the bug is, and just by looking into the code, I didn't find anything. So I needed to go deeper, and firstly, I tried to understand uh, which part of the algorithm was wrong. And to do so, I tried to get the data that was the result of the first stage and check whether it was sorted correctly. Unfortunately, it was hard because the operation failed and the intermediate data was removed, so I had no idea what is the result of the first stage. And to figure it out, I spent another hour or core dumping some processes and trying to get some rows from caches. And, okay, it was like a midnight, no more hopes for a beer with friends, and I figured out that most likely the problem was in the merge stage. I was not 100% sure, but it seemed quite likely. So, I was reading and reading the code again, I was looking into the core dump, and I didn't find anything, everything looked fine. It was, I guess, 1 a.m. and I'm starting getting crazy because I didn't understand how is it possible. So finally, my last hope, I opened the core dump and started looking at the rows that were sorted incorrectly. And the rows that were wrong were just some URLs of sites that have been sorted. And all of these URLs belong to one site, say, I don't know, ubuntu.com. And all of these rows had, uh, were started from ubuntu.com, except for the one, which was ubuntu.coe. Seems strange, how is it possible? I had no idea for, I don't know, a half of an hour, and after that I got my last hope. I opened the ASCII table and looked for codes of M and E. Oh well. The difference was eight, so it was a bit flip. Thanks, Cosmic Ray, for no beer this Friday.